Hello, everybody, and welcome in to eBible Fellowship's continuing Bible studies into the book of 1 Samuel, heard at this very same time, Monday through Friday. And we thank you for being with us wherever you are and however you're listening to us, either through eBible Fellowship's webcast audio or through Skype or perhaps through Pal Talk or even over the phone. And we pray that the Lord's blessings will be with us over the next 30 minutes or so as we now prepare to open our Bibles and introduce. Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Bible study in the book of 1 Samuel, and we're currently in chapter 2. Let's read, um, let's read from verse 2. There is none holy as Jehovah, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For Jehovah is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry cease, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that has many children is wax feeble. And uh, we'll stop reading there. Uh, in our last study, we were looking at verse 3. And here <clears throat> we saw that God is moving Hannah to um, rebuke the the proud woman who was her adversary. But in, in doing this, it really isn't a, a rebuke of all of the ungodly, of all of the unsaved, that... Um, have proudly and arrogantly set themselves in opposition to the will of God and to uh, the the salvation plan of God. And and you can be sure, and uh, we all can be sure, that in the days, in the years, in the centuries, leading up to the coming of Christ, for over 11,000 years that one of the chief, one of the the main points of the adversaries of truth, of the adversaries of God, of Satan himself, as he would stir this up amongst um, his servants, his emissaries, would be, where is the Messiah? Well, didn't God promise to send the Messiah? Didn't he um, indicate that the Messiah would come? And how long has it been now? You, you can be sure this would be pointed out again and again after 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, after 6,000 years. And in about that time, the flood came. No Messiah. And then following the flood, Time continued. Where is the promise of the Messiah, the fulfillment of the the Lord, um, God Himself entering into the human race? Where where is um, this so-called Messiah? And the adversaries, well, they could have had a, a field day in in wickedness. And just speaking contrarily and accusing and and uh, making baseless accusations. They were baseless because God had his timetable. God had his uh, set time that he intended to bring the Lord Jesus into the world. And and yes, it by man's uh, viewpoint, it was a long time. Over 11,000 years, but still all according to the timetable of God. And leading up to it, Satan goes to work, working on the confidence of the saints, working on their, their faithfulness, uh, operating on their trust in the promises of the word of God. And this is what he does. This is 
um, his specialty. He is uh, he excels. He is expert at getting people to doubt, of stirring up the questions in the minds of individuals. Hath God said? Is the first doubt that Satan was able to raise, and we see all the catastrophic consequences of that from the Garden of Eden. And and yet, if only God's people, and God's people did, but it's a struggle. It, it's not easy, not uh, possessing knowledge, not having all information, and it and not knowing um, things that that um, are yet to come to pass. We know that they will come to pass. We have a trust in the Word of God. We know God is true and faithful, and He cannot lie, and He will fulfill every thing that he has ever said every jot and every tittle and the believers true believers have always known this but still still while we wait during the period of waiting well it's at that time that that the enemy can come and the enemy does use this period of uh of waiting on the lord to assault the the idea that God will ever be faithful, that he will ever fulfill his promises. And and uh, Penina is typifying this type of adversary who, who would uh, say to Hannah, um, your, who, who she would emphasize Hannah's barrenness and the fact that God had not heard her prayer, God had not blessed her with a child, but uh, her herself, Penina, she had several children, <clears throat> so she she was the one blessed, and not Hannah, and and this is the distinction between the people of God and the people of the world, and yet God did, He did uh, fulfill His promise, He did bring Christ into the world, and. And the child was born. The Messiah uh, was um, uh, uh, born into the world. He did become a man. He entered the human race so that Simeon could hold the baby, the, the very child of the promise, in his arms. And let's take a look at that because this is a beautiful picture of ultimate fulfillment of the the promise of Christ's first coming, and it will be uh, also true of Christ's second coming in Luke chapter 2, in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, we can see the similarity. He was waiting and so were all the saints of God waiting for a much longer time than we have. If we haven't even waited 2,000 years since the cross. But these people had waited over five times that, over 11,000 years. And, and Simeon is typifying the elect that waited on God uh, for him to uh, to bring forth Christ to send the Messiah into the world and it says and the Holy Ghost was upon him and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ and he came by the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. There it is, finally, after 
such a long time. And Simeon, in taking up the baby Jesus and holding him in his very arms, he could feel the child. He could see the child. And he could see God's salvation. And there was the fulfillment of the promises of God for thousands of years. And and yet God was faithful. He didn't forget. He didn't um he, he didn't omit anything and and he didn't wait um overly much god waited perfectly until the proper time and then all was done and we can see that as we look at the biblical timeline of history how everything happened in the set course of events that god had established it, it was not random. It was not haphazard. It it um, it was something that um, that could have been predicted, as individuals would have studied the timeline of history prior to the birth of Christ, and even God did reveal to Simeon that he would see the Lord's Christ. Well, Hannah is making her prayer and. And um, and addressing the proud, the the adversaries of God, they do not wait on the Lord. They they do not trust God. They do not trust His promises nor His word. And she uh, indicates they should not be so exceeding proud, and arrogancy should not come out of their mouth. Then it says at the end of verse three, for Jehovah is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. And, you know, this is a a very true statement that God is a God of knowledge. And when we think about God, when we consider him, and we we just um, meditate on him, it, it would be, uh, always a good thing to meditate on any part of the Word of God, but to meditate specifically upon God Himself and what He is like. I'm sure you've done it. You've uh, quietly thought what uh, type of being He is and what kind of characteristics He possesses. And one of um, His greatest characteristics, if we could rate them, which we can't, they're all great, but one of the greatest things about God is the knowledge that he possesses, that he is. He is a God of knowledge. And knowledge is something that that uh, we in the world um, normally value and we respect and we, we appreciate, we think highly of um, people who, who possess a great deal of knowledge. The more knowledge people have, the smarter we think they are, and the more respect they receive. And, and uh, this is um, normally uh, in view with people's degrees. If they have a college degree, we, we tend to think they're smarter than someone who has a high school degree. Or if they have a master's, well, they've gone a level further. Or a doctorate, and, and some have even several of these advanced degrees. And so we, we give uh, individuals that have knowledge a great deal of respect. And, and we respect their opinion because they're speaking from a point of knowledge. They know a lot. And and uh, we don't know as much, maybe, and so we listen to them. And we have experts and professionals who give us their opinion on all sorts of things. When we have a problem, we go to someone um, it, it, who who's an expert in the field. That is, they specialize in that particular field. If we have a plumbing problem, we go to a plumber who knows a great deal 
about plumbing or if we we have a problem with any kind of um, repair, we go to someone who can fix it. A mechanic knows a great deal about automobiles. Or if we have an illness, we go to a doctor, and he possesses a great deal of knowledge about medicine. And and so it is. Uh, it's it's uh, rare. I, I don't think you'll find it um, that common at all. I don't. Uh, I don't think there is anybody like this who can um, be completely knowledgeable or possess a lot of knowledge about plumbing and about fixing your car and about being a doctor or about science or someone else who has a lot of knowledge in law and and is a lawyer. No, it, it's very very few people that that uh, might know um, some uh, amount of information about all these subjects, but hardly anyone, if anyone, specializes in the knowledge of all of these things and, and the other thousands of things that are in the world, the other thousands of, of um, professions and, and specialties that people get into. Cooks know a great deal about cooking and and so on. People have to dedicate themselves and devote time and effort into learning one particular thing normally. And then after some time, they develop knowledge in that particular field that maybe comes to be respected. And, And this is how men gain knowledge in the world we it doesn't come naturally to us it doesn't come easily we have to put forth a great deal of effort and those that have the most ability and also um probably are the more diligent in whatever field or endeavor they get into they gain the most and best knowledge and yet when we we take an honest look if we would appraise the knowledge of man, we we see that man's knowledge is extremely limited, extremely limited, where you can take someone who maybe gets into uh, uh, the medical field and we have more respect for someone like that because it's more complicated, more um, important. Than working on a car because these doctors will be working on people's bodies, and and they even in that field, there's um, uh, those who focus on one particular aspect of medicine. They get into um, the 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 field of of uh, dealing with children or OBGYN or they specialize in in a certain form of cancer <clears throat> or they become a general practitioner and and so it is even within one field it gets broken down into uh, so many different departments that no one man or woman is able to learn hardly um, any of it they can learn bits and pieces of these other things but normally they specialize and they they learn a lot about one aspect of their particular uh, profession, and and it just shows how much they do not know. You know that's what what all these things show. I, I mean, I'm sure you've you've experienced this too, when something breaks in your house, how. Um, how inadequate you can feel. Oh, I don't know how to fix that. And it, if you're a husband, maybe your wife is looking at you. How can you not know how to fix that? Well, I never learned. I, I, I don't know how to fix the washer. I don't know how to fix the dryer. And and something else breaks, and something else, and 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 maybe the car. No, I I don't know anything about mechanics either. And the more we go along in life. Uh, we might pick up 
tidbits here and there. But for the most part, we're going to find out how much we don't know, how much knowledge we lack in all of these fields, in all of these areas. And so we have to keep going to someone who specializes in, in that particular field. And this is um, due to our limitations as a finite man, as a creature created, yes, in the image and likeness of God, but created where we, we are uh, created with severe limitations, where we just do not know a great deal about even the things of the world. And and that that lack of knowledge um, is is uh, even more in evidence when we turn to spiritual things. We we have no spiritual knowledge. We have really no understanding of God. If He were not pleased to reveal Himself and to uh, to grant us some some uh, understanding of who he is, we we would not know anything. And and so here we have mankind on one hand and our tremendous limitations and our uh, liabilities, our inability to really understand very much of anything about even one subject and yet we're we're confronted with a whole world of things that that we lack understanding towards but on the other hand then we have god he is a god of knowledge and god is the one who created the world who created all the creatures he's the one who uh, opens up the understanding of man to understand the the little that we we do know. He's the one who uh, has recently given man the ability to understand the the um, uh, uh, electronic medium and and DNA and all these things that God has hidden within the creation. And God is a God of knowledge concerning everything related to this world and everything related to whatever other worlds he's created and to himself. God actually possesses knowledge that extends from eternity past, which has no beginning point. That's where his knowledge would, well, we would say, begin, though it has no beginning and continues into eternity future, which has no end. And everything, everything that is in that whole spectrum of existence, everything that is to be known, that, that could possibly be understood, is, is known by God. He has knowledge of all those things. Now we know, for instance... The Bible tells us he knows the end from the beginning. And and that helps us to say, well, that means he didn't learn about the end as we're going along here. He knew it from the beginning. He's always known about the end. And, and the Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, Jesus uh, took upon him the sins of his elect people. And a lot of times we make that statement and we don't stop and think, well, that means before the world was, God knew that he would create the world for one, that mankind would fall into sin, that um, this would impact, <clears throat> excuse me, every single human being, and that he would have to develop a salvation plan. And so God knew every human being who would be born, and he determined to save certain ones who he knew in advance. He, 
he predestinated them to salvation. He chose them. In order to choose them, he had to know them. He had to know them intimately. He knew when they would be born, and he knew uh, what their names would be. Certainly, he knew everything else, what we look like, how many hairs on our head, and and so on. God knew all these things about the elect. And then Jesus took upon himself the sins of all of these individuals. Before the world began, before these people were born, in some cases thousands and thousands of years before they were born, um, and and he paid the penalty, the wrath of God, the the wages of sin is death, and so Jesus died on on their behalf before the world began, and and all this was done, and then he rose from the dead before the world began because God is a God of knowledge, and he knew everything that was necessary. In order to bring this to pass, he knew not only the individuals he intended to save, but he knew our sins in intimate detail. He knew the sins of every one of us because all of our sins had to be laden upon Christ. Christ had to bear them, and so that means each one of them had to be identified and placed on Christ. He couldn't miss one. He he couldn't um, uh, omit a single sin, or else he wouldn't pay the penalty in full. So for every sin of thought, of word, and of deed, for a great multitude, probably about 200 million individuals, who were yet to be created and who were yet to enter the human race and therefore yet to sin in all these um, uh, numerous ways, um, in multitudes of ways that they would, these this mountain uh, of sins had to be laid upon Christ with great intimacy and knowledge. And this is why it says in Isaiah 53, In verse 10, yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. This was the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in knowing these individuals and knowing them um, to the degree that he could identify their dirty, ugly, rotten sins to the point of having them all placed upon himself and he becoming sin for us. This is just one Um, evidence of the knowledge of the Lord. And uh, we'll have to um, discuss this further the next time we get together. We have come to the end of our time tonight. Um, Thank you for joining us, and please join us again tomorrow evening. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Chris McCann with his continuing studies into the book of 1 Samuel. These studies are heard every Monday through Friday night at this very same time over Pal Talk, over Skype, over eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over the phone. Lord willing, we'll have another Bible study for you tomorrow night into the book of 1 Samuel. And until then, may the Lord's perfect will be done. Good night.